Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, work we've done over the past um, two to three years to try and rebuild um, local uh, and regional staple crop economies for farmers in Illinois and surrounding states. Um, and this work uh, is based off of um, uh, a book by Dan Barber it's called The Third Plate. Um, it's really good. He spent 10 years working on it and traveled the world. Uh, but in this book, he um, described what our food system would look like if people ate with farmers in mind, if they ate uh, the products of diverse crop rotations. Um, so it's, it's an interesting um, book to read. And it got me started down this path of thinking about um, integrating staple crops into the local food movement. So I'm a local food system educator. Uh, my job is to try to develop local food systems, but we tend to focus on fruits and vegetables to do that. And so the idea behind the Grain Guild was to bring staple crops into the movement. And that makes sense because these are the crops that most people eat most of the time and the crops that farmers are already growing and they're easier to handle um, and uh, distribute. So the idea behind the Grain Guild is that we connect everybody in the food system together, the plant breeders, the farmers, the millers, bakers, chefs, and consumers. We find varieties that work for the farmers, and then we make sure they also work for everybody else in the system. And then we um, can develop the markets and demand for the crops from there. So this is one of the groups that um, I'm working with. Uh, the benefit of starting this project a few years ago is that it dovetailed with consumer interest and demand, and so it has been really easy to enlist support and develop this whole system. So uh, this is the, uh, a diagram of the Artisan Grain Collaborative. So around the circle there, you see all of the different groups in and around Chicago that are working to get more staple crops into Chicago. Um, Jack Arisman's farm, Goldmine Farms is there, um, distribution companies, um, Kendall College. So Kendall College is a culinary college in Chicago, and we're working with them to try to create um, a bread lab. So Steve Jones at Washington State runs something called the Bread Lab. It's, it's a place where they analyze crops, grains, assess their um, nutrient content and how well they work for different uses like making bread. So we're trying to replicate that at Kendall College so we can trial new varieties of crops, send them up there, they can evaluate them and develop the metrics that the bakers um, need to create their recipes. So we're, we are working towards that. Another important um, partner in this collaborative is, is Gourmet Gorilla. So they are a food system provider. They provide food to the Chicago public school system and they use local grains, and we're working with them to try to scale that up. So we're looking at these larger scale markets. And so this work is part of um, other movements. So we're trying to bring um, this diagram here for the food commons. We're trying to bring the new economy movement together. And what this means is there are movements um, around money now, slow money, um, investors are thinking differently about how they use their money. It is not all about maximum short-term returns like it used to be. There are people that have social investments. They want their money um, to do good. So we are tapping into that. There's a movement called Agriculture of the Middle. Um, and this is a movement to prioritize trying to protect mid-scale family farms. So we're talking about hundreds of acres, not thousands of acres. These are the farms that are most at risk and the farms that we are losing because they can't compete at the farmer's market and they can't compete with the biggest farms. So they're stuck in the middle and we're losing them. But these are the farms that can be flexible and adaptable and implement diverse crop rotation. So there's a whole movement around this. And then finally, the local food movement. Um, it just taps into consumer demand. And when you bring all those things together, this uh, group called the Food Commons is based out of California. The current president lives in Chicago, but we are trying to bring their model to Illinois and either adopt it or modify it and use it. But the model is that you create an alternative system. 
to our industrial commodity system. So they have their own bank, their own business structure, their own way of handling, distributing money, of managing businesses, and it's all done in a cooperative manner that is more democratic and equitable and more of the money is returned to farmers. So this is one of the main points I wanna make is we do all this work on production and it's a lot of fun and it's what I would choose to do given a choice, but you can only do that so long before you realize that the real barrier to all of this is marketing, right? It's not that hard to grow crops, especially if you listen to Gary and take some of his advice. It's not that hard. We have tremendous productive capacity. We can overwhelm any market that opens up. So the real challenge is marketing and putting as much time and effort into marketing and opening up these markets. Um, so uh, there's a picture of broccoli up there because the New York Times had an article about broccoli a couple years ago which detailed what a major advertising firm would do if somebody went to them and said, we really want to sell broccoli, create a whole campaign around broccoli. Right, and this is a company that sells Coca-Cola and major products. So they sit around a table and they figure out how to sell broccoli. And the way you sell broccoli is not to list the nutritional attributes of broccoli, right? That is our inclination, it doesn't work. You can do it, but you're not gonna sell more broccoli. The way you sell broccoli is the same way you sell anything else. There is a clear formula, a very clear way to sell something. It doesn't matter if it's broccoli or Coca-Cola or a car. So that's what we have to do with anything, all the food, the products we're trying to sell. We have got to be as savvy and competent at marketing as the professionals. We can get people to eat anything. I mean, most people are eating junk food. So there was a campaign from Bold House Farms um, around baby carrots. And the whole motto of the marketing campaign was eat them like junk food. And sales went up. 13%. They put them in colorful bags, they put them in vending machines in schools, and the reason they did this is because, again, they hired a professional firm. So this firm goes into people's houses and opens up their refrigerator and looks inside their refrigerator. They figure out carrots live in the crisper drawer. No kid opens a crisper drawer because they don't want to eat carrots or apples or whatever hides in there. The moms don't want to open the crisper drawer because they associate it with having to peel carrots. Therefore, people don't eat carrots. So that's the kind of thing they learn. So carrots get turned in. Baby carrots are just drilled out full-size carrots. There is no real baby carrot. So they drill them out. They put them in a colorful bag. They put them in vending machines. So it's just an example of the kind of marketing that works, that increases sales. And so we have got to figure out how to apply that to our products. Uh, this is Steve Jones in the top, the director of the Bread Lab and the young baker that he employs. So they, they're doing amazing work out there. So we are not pioneering anything new here. Um, this has been done. Um, they have developed hundreds of varieties. There's lots of books written about this. The New Bread Basket, Uprisings. Um, in New York State, the East Coast, the West Coast, these systems have been developed, there are clear paths to follow. Uh, the Lentil Underground chronicles farmers in Montana in the 1980s who came together to sell lentils and they are still in business. So they started doing this in 1980s, a farmer cooperative um, business. A more modern day example, Shepherd's Grain out west, um, a group of farmers comes together, markets collaboratively, so they meet every year they decide um, on the markets that they have opened up, who's gonna grow what, and the price they're going to get that year. It's all settled, they go out and grow the crop, and they generate interest, so a lot of this is not glamorous, right? It's just, you gotta go to these events, you gotta have your table with your products, and you gotta sell it, you gotta market it, talk about it, and that's how they develop their markets. We also learned a lot visiting uh, Farmer Ground Flour in New York State, so this is a mill that's owned by uh, a farmer, a miller, and a baker. So I want to talk a little bit about the production side here because when you start talking about selling local grain, the, the first thing a lot of people will say is, well, we can't do that here, it's too variable. You can't, we have rain and humidity, it just doesn't work. Well, we have challenges, but there are ways to deal with those challenges, and this is one of them. So um, you can grow hard red winter wheat. We have done that. Um, 
Harold Wilkin is here. There's a variety called Warthog. Um, it was bred in Canada. It worked in New York. So we met with Cornell, um, saw what they did. We brought it to Illinois and planted it, and it has done well. And when we started, we were told, you can't do that, it won't work. Um, but it did work. It only, we've done it for one year, so that doesn't mean it's going to work every year, but it means it has potential. So anyway, grow something like warthog, hard red winter wheat, and then you can grow hard red spring wheat, which tends to be higher protein. You have augers in a bin like this, you can mix in the bin. So then you have a bin full of grain, you can hit the, the specifications that the bakers are asking for, the protein levels and other attributes. So now you, for every season, it may vary year to year, but it's once a year. So you're, you, now you have a volume of grain, very little variability. The bakers can work with this. The other part of it is, are things like a batch dryer. So if you're going to market low, you know, organic food grade grain, you got to go through a little more effort. You can't heat it up. Um, you have to try to do it gradually. And so this is a tool that does that. Again, not, not too difficult. But the fact that you have to do all these little extra steps helps it resist becoming a commodity, which helps you retain higher profitability. So um, if you kind of step back and, and look at agriculture and organic farming and where things are going, there's a lot of positive things happening, but there also are challenges. And one of them is that the whole system of agriculture is shifting towards organic. But if we don't get serious about marketing and capturing part of this market, it is all going to go um, to Amazon, to, the, to these industrial versions of farming. They are going to capture the market. And they're, they are serious about it. They are moving to do it. And they know what they're doing. And they are taking it over. And this is an example of that Thrive Market. This may work for some farmers. This is a wholesale buying club. So they sell for organic food for lower prices. Um, and it may work for farmers, but the big companies are good at marketing and they're capturing this niche in the marketplace. So this is the kind of food the Thrive Market sells. This is a new version of cereal. It's purple corn flakes basically that has three ingredients, corn, sugar, and salt. This is what people want to buy now. They want it to be purple because of the antioxidants and the color purple, and they don't want it to have 20 ingredients. So I saw that and I thought, man, wouldn't it be nice if there was a red, purple corn that we could grow and trial and get out to farmers? Well, there is. This is a picture of it. It's been 25 years in development. Um, it's sold by Adaptive Seeds out in Oregon. Um, so farmers out there have been breeding this for 25 years. It's open pollinated corn that could be grown and developed here. And farmers could save the seed, build marketing and businesses around crops like this and capture the value. So the other thing to think about here, farmers get somewhere around 10% of the food dollar, depending on the crop and the scenario. But the other 90% Right, are made by the companies that handle the grain and add value to it. So we should spend less time obsessing over the 10% and start capturing some of the 90%. So another emerging market and a way to do that is this whole movement around plant-based protein and fake meat. So this is a big market. The, the industry is shifting and people are okay with buying fake meat. You may not think it sounds good, but uh, industrial chicken isn't that good, and it's not hard to use pea protein and make an acceptable replacement for it. So that picture on the bottom left is basically pea protein and a few other things made to look, smell, and taste like chicken. And they're also making burgers um, that taste like chicken. So we ought to be, or sorry, burgers that taste like beef. We ought to be... Um, breeding crops for Illinois farmers to tap into this market. We can grow peas. It's not that hard. Um, there's an opportunity there. Uh, another big opportunity in market is um, malting grains, uh, beer distilling, that side of things. So we can't really get people to eat whole food very much, but we can get them to drink it. 
So um, this is Tor Oshner on the right. He's the farmer owner of Farmer Ground Flour. And the young guy on the left is a maltster. And so this is an interesting story because we are moving to develop malting facilities in Illinois and the Midwest um, because it's a huge market and it just makes sense. But again, you're faced with the same criticisms. We can't do that here. We'll, we'll get vomitoxin levels. So maybe th this happened to Tor. He grew barley, got rained on. He had high vomitoxin which means in many cases, if it's high enough, you lose the crop. You can't even sell it for feed. Or maybe it gets relegated to livestock feed, but you're not getting the value you hope for. So that happened to Tori, took it to this young guy. The guy did a little research. He varied his malting recipe. You know, it has to do with time, temperature, and other factors. Anyway, the point is this guy figured out how to take high vomitoxin wheat and make it work and turned it into food grade malted barley. So now Tor is getting a premium. It's not that hard. Why aren't we doing that here? Why aren't we recruiting young people? Because that is a huge bottleneck and it can be opened up. It was opened up here. Um, so the other part of what we're working towards are perennial crops. So again, like Gary said, the root cause of most of our problems are growing large scale monocultures of two annual crops. We need more diversity. Um, there's a lot of research being done with perennial crops. Kernza is intermediate wheatgrass. It is a perennial crop. So the picture you see here, so this is Kernza and the roots. This is a regular wheat plant right here. This is the soil line. Look at those wimpy roots, so hardly anything there. So that's why we need Kernza. That's why we want it on the landscape. It, you can harvest it as grain. You can cut it as hay, you can graze it. It's very flexible. It's being grown in Illinois. Jack Arisman has been growing it for years. It needs some work. It has been under development for 20, 30 years now, but it is being worked on and improved. Um, and Patagonia Provisions is making beer out of it. So markets are developing around Kernza. Koval is a distiller in Chicago and they, they work with a lot of different grains. Um, again, this is another huge value add for grain. Um, the picture there is gray millet. I met some farmers out in North Dakota that grow gray prozo millet and they just love the crop. They want, that's all they want to do is talk about millet and how tough it is. It's a warm season annual, but again, it's flexible. Um, it could be fit into our rotations. Um, it can be sold into distilling markets. It's also gluten-free and highly nutritious. So it's, there is a trend towards this sort of thing. It could be sold to people. Part of the challenge here is um, you have to dehull it. So dehulling is another barrier. Um, but again, I would say it is surmountable. We can dehull grain. We have to get to a scale to justify the investment in the equipment to do that. But it is not that hard. Um, so I have an idea for a marketing campaign for the gray millet. This is just an example of the kind of thing you have to do, right? If you want to sell millet, people will say, well, it needs to be white. People want white millet. No, people will, people will buy it. If you have a savvy campaign, if you tap into modern consumer culture and you make people laugh and you make, you make them think about it. So here's, here's the slogan. You guys, somebody take it and run with it. You're going to get rich. Fifty shades of gray millet. This is Glenn Roberts at Anson Mills. Um, he is amazing. He has revived rice culture and the whole food scene in the Southeast. He runs this company, he knows more about grain, handling grain and quality and milling than anybody I've ever talked to. Um, just a total visionary. And uh, so what he's doing now is growing polyculture. So basically you could envision um, Gay Brown and his cover crop cocktails, like 20 species together in a field. Um, Glenn Roberts is doing that with grain crops and then milling them and uh, making loaves of bread out of it. There is no reason we can't be doing the same thing here. You get, there are tremendous benefits to having diverse crops in the field. You don't have as many issues with pests and disease and soil fertility when you have all those different root structures and root exudates, you know, in the soil. So it is something to um, seriously consider. 
the Boris brothers, Tutopolis, Illinois. So they have a seed company there. I buy corn from them. They grow four or five varieties of silage corn and they sell to dairy farmers. They grow a variety called Henry Moore. Glenn Roberts at Anson Mills considers it the best hominy corn he's ever worked with, which means it's probably the best hominy corn in the world. So the Boris brothers, I, ca I call them and try to talk about it. Man, they're not into hominy. They're into silage corn. They don't, they don't talk about that. Um, the Boris brothers sell it for a dollar a pound. Glenn Roberts sells it for five dollars a pound. Same corn. He's not even processing it. How many corn? You just take the corn and soak it in lye water. He's adding five times the value just because he understands marketing and how to talk to chefs. This is a picture of uh, Harold Wilkin with uh, Janie's Farm in Iroquois County and Ellen King with Hewn Bakery um, in Evanston. And they're standing in the field of uh, warthog wheat. So Harold and Ellen, this is an example of the kind of relationships that, that are being built around local grain and marketing. Um, Harold has invested in um, a flour mill and will be um, milling and selling flour into um, Chicago and other markets. And this is what it looks like inside um, his building where the mill is being installed right now. Last I heard. <laughs> uh, so 3% to 100%, that's just to say we currently produce, grow about 3% of the food we eat here. We could grow 100%. So there's research out now, it's really amazing. If you look at the Midwest, um, every person in the Midwest could be fed within 13 miles of where they live. It just kind of, it goes back to our soils and our ability to produce. If you look at Chicago, 75 miles. Every single person in Chicago could be fed within 75 miles of Chicago. Um, this is a color sorter. So again, this is, a, this is an example of a piece of equipment that is expensive, but I think it can easily be justified because what this machine can do, so um, this is a series of cameras connected to a computer and, you, and the grain drops in front of the camera and it recognizes color, shape, very subtle variations in seed. So it's used typically to, to clean seed, to clean um, off types or diff like to get your barley out of your wheat kind of thing. But there's been research done to show that um, it can reduce vomitoxin. It can detect kernels of wheat or other grains that are infected with vomitoxin and it separates them out of the lot. So sometimes we have a hard time getting farmers to grow wheat because if you have a couple wet summers like we've had, they get high vomitoxin and they can't sell it. Well, this machine would allow somebody, whoever wants to invest in it, to be able to buy high vomitoxin wheat from farmers and turn it into food grade wheat. Run it, so what you would do, just use typical cleaners, right? Gravity table, spiral cleaner. You can take it from 10 parts per million down to three or four, something like that but you have to get it below one. The color sorter can take it from four below one. All right, now I, want to, now I get to talk about corn. Yeah, corn, uh, it's just such a fascinating crop, right? It's like the source of our problems and, and the solution to our problems at the same time. Um, this is an awesome book. We're working on corn breeding. Um, this is Frank Kutka uh, from North Dakota. He's a corn breeder and he developed, he developed quite a few varieties, one of which is called Rebellion. So this is open pollinated yellow dent corn that has gametophytic incompatibility, which just means it blocks um, pollen from other dent corn. So it limits cross pollination, increases the likelihood that you retain your premiums for organic. Um, Frank's an interesting guy. Uh, so this is a, a diverse corn. So our modern corn hybrids have 5% or less of the genetic diversity in corn, which is part of the reason that they are fragile and they require so many um, inputs to support them. We could have diversity in corn. We could create more resilient corn plants. And so we've submitted a $2 million grant to do that, to breed corn for organic systems. And so part of what we're doing is what Gary was talking about earlier. We're working with nature, with the soil. If we have healthy soil, we can minimize inputs to corn. 
This is an amazing book. This is all about the life in the soil. If you want to learn about bacteria and microbes in the soil and in your gut and the relationships between them, it's all spelled out in this book. Um, so what we're trying to do is increase diversity and increase um, vigorous roots and traits like that. So this is a picture of Chapalote. This is a, here's the ears. It's a 4,000 year old flint corn. It's brown. It's a crazy plant, but it has super vigorous roots. And it's an example of the kind of plant that we're folding into our breeding program. We're also working with highly pigmented corn. So orange corn, this is an orange flint corn that Frank developed. Um, you see that hard orange starch there. It's packed full of nutrients. So if you feed it to chickens, you get eggs like this. So the yolks on top, the dark orange yolks were fed that corn. It's just an example of the kind of niche you could create for a crop like that, selling it to uh, chicken farmers. I'm working on a flint corn composite, which is, um, remains to be seen how relevant it is. I enjoy it. I'm folding together about 50 types of flint corn. So the idea here is to get as much diversity into the crop as we can, have farmers save seed, and uh, see what happens. So this would be targeted towards direct human consumption. So if people w could make cornbread, this would be a stellar variety to grow for cornbread. Another one we learned about this year, so Harold grew this one. This is Hickory King. Man, this is amazing. I thought white corn would be really mild and uh, a tough sell, but this is an amazing corn, tastes really good. So we are working to develop that one. This is Greg Wade. Um, he's a baker in Chicago with Publican Quality Bread. He helps us out a lot. He tests our varieties. Uh, he comes to our field days. He makes giant loaves of bread like this and sells it to restaurants. So people in Chicago are eating um, good bread made with local grain. And the point I want to make here is um, that we can use our wheat to make bread. We can use it for a lot of things, but there is a misconception that we can't grow bread wheat here. But, so what this picture shows, the percentage, 15, 33, 50, 75, that's the percent of local wheat in that loaf. And basically what you can see, it doesn't change that much. People could deal with the, the 75 or even the 100% local loaf of bread. It comes down to marketing and, uh, and talking about it. So if we want this to happen, um, we need more people growing grain and eating it because you've got to have direct experience with something to be an effective uh, salesperson and talk about it. All right. I think I got a minute here to go through this. So this is where I'm headed. So I started the grain project, but grain and these crops are baby steps, right? We have got it. We need more diversity. Just having organic monocultures of annual crops is not going to get us where we need to be if we want to address the challenges that we face with soil health, water quality, air quality, that type of thing. So we started a new group. Uh, it's called Regenerate Illinois. The idea being to really sit down and figure out and promote diverse regenerative farming. So we're talking about integrating livestock, integrating perennial crops, into a diverse system. So this list here, what we're thinking about doing is, is working with people to create a conservation plan where we maximize the use of all the conservation programs, all the um, fees basically that we can charge. So hunting leases, fishing leases, conservation programs, pollinator programs. You can charge people to watch birds. I just learned about there's some program called Plover for the Plovers, the wetlands. They're paying farmers $1,000 an acre to hold water for plovers. And it was funded by bird watchers, apparently, at least in part. And I just learned about that this morning. So anyway, this idea has tremendous potential. We can build in probably so much income just by pursuing this side of things that farmers then would have the flexibility to do something different. Because right now, they're under such pressure, they're just like, they can't think about any of this stuff. So we're going to open it up and say, look, you don't, have to, you don't have to do it that way. We don't have to play by the same rules. We are going to use this to our advantage. We're going to connect to all these sources of income. And then people will say, well, you don't have a source of labor. How are you going to do that? Nobody wants to do that work. Well, we're going to use multiple farmers. So we're going to stack enterprises. We're going to stack the farmers up. 
Somebody can manage livestock, somebody can manage the trees, somebody else does the vegetables. And if that doesn't work, we'll reach out to the immigrant community, the people that we have displaced from their farms in Mexico and other places. They're now here cutting up our chickens and we can work with them and say, you can be a farmer again, you can run a diversified farm and we're gonna help you do it. So we're looking at a pilot on the Mackinac River. This is a Google Earth uh, watershed view. So Bloomington Normal is right here, it's where I live. God, I have all sorts of connections here. So that's a nature preserve. This is mostly nature preserve. So we're working with a land trust that owns land along the Mackinac. So what we're gonna do, partner with Iroquois Valley Farmlands who buys farmland and leases it to farmers. And we're gonna work with parklands. We're gonna identify priority areas so we're gonna create buffer zones for parklands around their preserves. We're gonna create connectivity between their preserves so they benefit. We're gonna work with Iroquois Valley to acquire that land. And then we're gonna have all of those easements and programs on it and recruit the farmers to come in and manage it. And we're gonna create um, something beautiful. There's a really cool video out there. It's called Life in Syntropy, Ernst Gauche. It's about 1,200 acres in Brazil where they implemented this idea. They changed the weather, they changed the water, springs, the creeks came back. It's just uh, an amazing story. But one line in there, he said, every place on earth is a paradise. So that's how I'm thinking about this project now. We're gonna create paradise here on the Mackinac River. This is my last slide. I like this hat. I want a hat like this. Um, and I think, you know, it has roses in it. And uh, so part of what I want to say here is uh, when you farm in this way, so Harold and Dave and others will tell you um, there are a lot of benefits from aligning with what consumers want. One of those is that you get appreciated and it's nice to be appreciated. The other thing is um, things tend to go your way. So there, are no, there is no way to anticipate what might happen. So you can easily generate a huge list of reasons why it doesn't make sense to do any of this stuff because it's hard. But you cannot predict. I had no way of understanding where this would go. If you start to do this, you will meet people, they will help you, you will find the right people, and you can make it all work out. We have time for one or two questions. Does anyone have a question for Bill? And please wait, raise your hand if you do and I'll get the microphone to you. Okay. I just want you to repeat the name of the film you just referred to. Oh, it's a funny word. Uh, S-Y-N-T-R-O-P-Y, syntropy. It basically is the opposite of entropy. It's like creating beauty. Ernst Gosch is the farmer. It's on YouTube, it's 15 minutes. It's a little hard to watch because it's in multiple languages. Just stick with it because it creates a beautiful vision of what's possible. So they're in Brazil, but we can replicate that model. They're growing tropical plants. But the idea is that we integrate intensive alley cropping in agroforestry systems. So we, for us, it's you know chestnut trees, hazelnut shrubs, oak trees, whatever kind of tree we want. And then the alleys are vegetables, fruit, hay, pasture, diverse multi-species livestock all together. Uh, on that Regen Regenerate Illinois project, are you partnered up with Savannah Institute on that effort? Yeah, so the Savannah Institute is based here. Um, they work with farmers across the Midwest to plant um, agroforestry type plantings. They have research here on South Farms. They're growing chestnut trees, hazelnut shrubs, currant bushes all sorts of fruit together in a diverse system. And so they've agreed to work with us. So what we might do is have them install these plantings on the land that we acquire. And then it'll be managed by other farmers that are doing the intensive land use and five years down the road when that matures, then that, that gets folded in and becomes part of the income stream. So we're getting creative. All right, any other questions? We have time for one more. Okay. 
they, they took on watersheds just like Bill described, and they have a group that has implemented and is actively doing what Bill's talking about. So I'm really excited to hear what Bill's talking about that. From that, one thing that we talked about, what made things uh, allow to happen, and from that, a bunch of engineers that we've gotten together from that meeting, and we were piloting uh, community driven uh, equipment for bakeries so we can have our own mills. So we're doing a cleaning system, a milling system, and a malting if someone wants to do that. So each of these communities, oh, and a, and a, and a crusher for uh, oils. So it's kind of interesting. So we're teaming up with large teams of people that's helping make this move. So I'm really excited. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Bill, any final thoughts? I, just, I have one last thing, and it, it doesn't relate to grain. It relates to um, the paper in your folder, the, the survey. So if you guys could fill that out, that would be helpful to me just to capture that data. But also on the back side, there are survey questions. So um, if you could answer those, and then basically it's an opportunity for you to let me and uh, University of Illinois know what is important to you. So whatever you value and think that um, you'd like to see come out of U of I and Extension, if you put it down there, we, we do listen. We are um, trying to be flexible and adaptable, and we're looking at um, trying to invest in new faculty positions like endowed chairs for organic plant breeding. So we're, we're moving in that direction, but we need to hear from farmers. We need to know that um, that's something that is valuable for you.